What if the clearance checks we've trusted for decades are costing us millions while protecting against events with odds lower than winning the lottery? And what if that's built into the system? Traditional gauging assumes the worst case scenario for every variable. But what if we asked a better question? How likely is the worst case to occur? In this video, I'll explore how the shift to probabilistic gauging is helping engineers to make smarter, more targeted decisions. It's reshaping how we measure clearance, assess risk, and design infrastructure. Gauging, also called clearance assessment, is the process of checking whether a train can safely pass through its route without hitting nearby infrastructure or other vehicles. It also aims to minimise the stepping gap at platforms. When we talk about infrastructure, that includes tunnels, bridges, platforms and line-side signals. Anything fixed close to the running line. Trains don't run like rigid boxes. They sway, lean and bounce as they move along the track, especially at speed or through tight geometry. And while their outer shape may stay constant, components like wheels and suspension wear down gradually introducing subtle shifts in their position. Clearance and gauging are terms often used interchangeably, but the goal is the same, ensuring the safe space between trains and structures. Get it wrong? Train strike. A train clipping a platform edge or bridge soffit, risking structural damage or worse. Get it too cautious? Avoidable restrictions, rebuilding the infrastructure, lowering speeds or rejecting a new train, all that could have been run safely. Traditional gauging is built on the principle most engineers will recognise, tolerances. From bolts to bridges, every part has an acceptable range, a tolerance that defines how much a measurement can differ from its nominal size or position and still be considered acceptable. In traditional gauging, we take the worst case value for each tolerance and combine it with the dynamic movement we spoke about earlier and the overthrows of the vehicle into a single clearance envelope, usually called the swept envelope. Sometimes this is also incorrectly called a kinematic envelope. This swept envelope assumes the train is built at the maximum allowed vehicle width within the manufacturing tolerances, running on track at the extremes of lateral and vertical alignment tolerances and roughness, with extreme and or degraded suspension, and at the speed that gives the maximum movement to the inside and outside of the curves. All of these are then added together, and this is called compound stacking, combining the worst case for every variable as if they'll all happen at exactly the same time. It's conservative by design, but the consequence is that the envelope often demands more space than the train actually ever uses. That's led to restrictions. Routes are declared unsuitable for certain types of freight or passenger trains. Infrastructure is modified purely to meet that envelope requirement. New rolling stock is delayed or rerouted, even when it would have run perfectly without issue. Despite how rigid it sounds, Traditional gauging already includes a layer of judgement, often based on experience or precedent rather than published rules. Take suspension allowances. A typical minimum clearance might be 50mm, but if the suspension fails, that requirement is often reduced to 25mm instead. Why does that change? Because it's recognised that suspension failure is an incredibly rare event, and that a smaller clearance to the stiffer but potentially displaced suspension is acceptable. Similarly, there have been cases where clearances flagged as foul on paper have been approved in practice. Not because engineers were ignoring the rules, but because the situations leading to a calculated foul were judged to be extremely unlikely. Past data and proving runs show they have made no contact and nothing had changed to increase the risk. The judgement was if it's been safe up till now and nothing has degraded, then the clearance, while tight, is still acceptable. That judgement has always been there. Probabilistic gauging doesn't remove engineering judgement. It formalises it by making the levels of risk visible and measurable. Probabilistic gauging takes a different approach. Instead of using a single worst case value for every variable, it models how those variables actually behave in the real world. Let's take a few examples. Vehicle width. In reality, most trains aren't built to the full maximum width. Manufacturing tolerances mean some vehicles are slightly narrower and some are slightly wider, but still within design limits. Wheel wear. Wheels gradually wear down as they run along the track. Some wheels are brand new. Some are freshly turned, just back from the lathe, and others are close to needing reprofiling. That wear changes the vertical height of the vehicle on the rail. 
Suspension. The condition of the dampers, air springs and bushes varies, not just across the fleet but even between the different axles on the same train. That variation shifts the vehicle body in subtle ways. Each of these inputs is treated as a statistical distribution, which means a spread of values that reflect how often each one occurs. But in most cases, that distribution looks like a bell curve. A few trains will be at the extreme ends, either very worn or very wide, but most somewhere near the average. To analyse this, probabilistic gauging uses a method called Monte Carlo simulation. In simple terms, it's a technique that runs thousands of randomised simulations to see how likely each outcome is, based on all the realistic variations in the system. By doing this, it produces a statistical picture of real-world clearances, and from that, engineers can ask, how small might the clearance get realistically? How often would you expect that clearance to be exceeded? Is this a one in a thousand event or a one in a million event? Monte Carlo simulation is not used in traditional gauging. As we know, traditional gauging applies fixed tolerances, sometimes derived from the statistical maximum values, but does not simulate how these tolerances interact probabilistically. That's the shift from guarding against the theoretical extreme to measuring actual real-world risk. Traditional gauging is designed for an extreme scenario that almost never happens. Probabilistic gauging looks at how often things actually happen and what the consequences would be. Here's how the two approaches compare, shown on the screen now. Here's a practical analogy. Imagine one variable, say suspension wear, has a 1 in 10,000 chance of reaching its worst limit. Now add 9 more variables, assuming each has a similar low probability. The chance of all 10 of these happening together, roughly 1 in 10 to the 40. A number so small, it might not even happen once in the lifetime of the universe. That's what compound tolerance stacking protects against. Probabilistic gauging asks whether that protection is really necessary and whether the cost of that protection is justified. This isn't just a clever modeling method. It's already saving money and expanding network capability. In Scotland, probabilistic gauging was used to assess clearances of routes being upgraded for electrification. By simulating thousands of realistic scenarios, engineers were able to show that many foul points were statistically safe. That meant bridges didn't need to be raised, tracks didn't need to be lowered, and clearances could be accepted without intervention. The result? A saving of over £330 million on the overall programme, while still maintaining safe design margins. Maintenance has seen similar benefits. In gauging, clearance categories often determine an inspection frequency. If a location is classed as tight, according to traditional methods, it may be inspected every year or flagged for additional mitigation. But probabilistic gauging can reveal that the actual risk of contact is negligible, even when the envelope has been classed as too tight. That allows clearance categories to be updated, removing unnecessary risk flags, and helping maintenance teams focus on those areas where real movement or change is occurring. This video is kindly sponsored by D-Gage. They're the team behind D-Gage Rift, the only software available today that enables true probabilistic gauging. If you're serious about moving beyond the limitations of traditional gauging, D-Gage Rift is how you unlock the full benefits. Lower costs, smarter risk decisions, and assessments based on real-world data rather than assumed as streams. It's already saved rail projects hundreds of millions worldwide and cleared routes previously thought closed to specific train types. Find out more at dgage.co.uk forward slash software. We've spent decades building safety into gauging by assuming everything will go wrong, all at once. To be fair, that caution has served us well, but that mindset comes with a cost, sometimes a hidden one. Additional scope in infrastructure projects, more frequent inspections by maintenance, and decisions made to protect against the near impossible or unlikely. Probabilistic gauging doesn't remove caution. It helps us see where caution adds value and where that caution costs us more than it saves. It aligns gauging with other safety critical systems, where risk is measured, understood and proportionally managed. CAN affects the position of the vehicle on a curve, and that directly influences clearance, especially on tight infrastructure. If you'd like to explore how CANT and curvature affect vehicle movement and alignment, check out the free guide to CANT PDF linked below. Or take a look at my track geometry bundle, which covers the real world tools used to design, assess and maintain. Thanks for watching. And thanks to D-Gage for supporting this video.